Hare Krishna, Sukhuva Mataji. Thank you so much today for joining for this podcast. It's such a pleasure to have you here after a long time. Some time, yes. Been some time. It's yeah. really nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. So I feel that uh, there's a lot that has happened since our last, last podcast. And especially you have published not one, not two, but three books. I had some part in, in some of the books in making some small suggestions. But I felt that at several places where I've talked with devotees, especially in Whitefield in Bangalore, and even in other places, many devotees have talked with me about how they have found your session so helpful. So I thought we could talk today about now how uh, the how you have integrated, in one sense, the wisdom from our bhakti tradition and the wisdom from, say, contemporary psychology or personal growth. And you have presented that as a holistic package which can help devotees to go deeper into their bhakti and also to become broader in their approach to the approach to their relationships and that they're functioning in the world. So maybe I thought we could start with uh, uh, what inspired you on this journey? To, well, you could be, yeah, please. One thing I'd like to say is um, integration comes from Krishna. And I'd like to say a prayer to include Krishna in our podcast here um, because Krishna is the best psychologist and he is uh, the best healer. And of course, he's the best of everything. So I do like to include him. So I'd like to say a little prayer if that's okay. Sure. First, I want to also uh, acknowledge Srila Prabhupada and invite him in the room. Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Vastaya Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tinamine Namaste Sarasvati Devi Gauravani Pacharani Nirvishesha Shunyabhari Pashachati Deshtakamani. Your Krishna, Lord of our hearts, Lord of the universes, um, Please help us to feel your presence in this podcast. Help us to feel you creating a space within which we may discover more about you and more about ourselves. Thank you. Hi, Krishna. That's beautiful. In one sense, you know, the more we understand Krishna, the more we understand ourselves. Both of those go together. So that's very nice. And vice versa, so the more something. we understand ourselves, the more we understand Krishna too. Yes. So I'll be making some notes on my tablet. I won't be sharing it. It'll just you might just see my pen moving over here. So yes. I hope that doesn't distract you too much. It won't distract mm -hmm. me. Okay. Thank you. So let's begin with this that uh, maybe you could start with some of your your journey and what you what made you recognize the need or the value of such integration where there could be more holistic resources available for those who are on the bhakti path. Um, well, it probably came with my big, uh, what would we call it, rude awakening um, from okay. Krishna. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, in my life, I had been a devotee for 27 years. I had been practicing very strictly, working very hard doing whatever my authorities told me, uh, <clears throat> becoming what I thought was detached and becoming what I thought was a good devotee. 
And then at the age of 47, when I hit menopause, everything went haywire. And all the emotions that I had suppressed, thinking that I had been tolerant and stoic, they all came up in my face simultaneously. And so fast, I just became overwhelmed. And um, I went to different devotees and authorities for help. And what they told me was, you're in Maya. And I'm like, I know I'm in Maya. <laughs> can you say something that can help me out of this? Because I've never experienced anything like this. And they said, well, you, you just need to chant more. And I said, I am chanting and that's not working right now. <laughs> and so it just seemed like nobody could really help me within the movement. So I had to actually... I think that requires a... Sorry to interrupt you. I think that itself yeah. requires a certain level of courage to acknowledge that chanting is not working for me. Because the whole idea would be that, you know, just chant more attentively. And this is where I find that sometimes, you know, bhakti is a very broad thing. And bhakti is about our relationship with Krishna. And within that, our chanting is important, but it is not the only thing. But there are many aspects to our relationship with Krishna. And when we reduce the whole multifaceted relationship with Krishna just to chanting, then we not only make it difficult for us to continue in the practice of bhakti, but even if somebody does that, it's questionable whether they are really developing a relationship with Krishna. Isn't it? Well, yeah, there are so many different ways to chant. And it's not like I stopped chanting, but I needed some um, some additional support at that point. And I'm imagining, I mean, what I've come to understand is that the chanting for 27 years did help to bring all these things up because all these things were in my psyche. They were in my subtle body. They were there, but they were just being held down. But in actual reality, to purify, sometimes things have to come up, just like when we make ghee, you know, butter looks kind of yellow, looks kind of nice, you know, but then you boil it and boil it and boil it. And the last part of the purification into ghee the blackest things come up, all the impurities come up. So I I think the 27 years of chanting did help for all that stuff to come up, but then I needed some extra support. Now, again, you know, Krishna is so intelligent. He gives us so many ways in which to connect to him. He gives us so many facilities. He gives us, there's so much knowledge and all of that comes from Krishna. He's 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 trying to help us in so many ways. He brings avatars and acharyas throughout the ages. He keeps sending us so much help. And if we reduce it to just one little thing, we may be missing things that could actually help us where we're at. Now, of course, when you get to the point of being completely purified and realized, Yes, how much nectar is in those two syllables, Krishna? Yes, but that's someone who has doesn't have all that other purification to go through. Then they can very go go very deep into the chanting. But for me, I was had all these emotions and um, frustrations and anger coming up in me and you know and a devotee's not supposed to feel these and i had managed to push them down for 27 years but how could how could i um go on i was i hit up i hit up i hit a rock wall i needed something more to support me and to help me that, you know, the way you're sense? putting it is so nice. 
the way you're putting it is so nice actually that you know, it is Krishna itself, he can help us in many ways. Why should, if Krishna is unlimited, why should we limit the channels through which Krishna can help to just this or that channel? We have Srila Prabhupada when he was trying to do outreach in India. Uh, one of a postman told him that the people will throw away magazines, but they will keep books. Why don't you write books? And Prabhupada saw that as Krishna speaking to him. Isn't it so? Exactly. We can, we exactly. Can, we and, when the, and then when the sorry. So so I just to complete this point that that like while some some people might think that it's a deficiency in our Krishna consciousness that we are looking for some resources, say, beyond chanting. But another way we could see is that it, uh, we, it's, it's, actually, uh, it's actually the enhancement of our Krishna consciousness, that we, expansion of our Krishna consciousness, that we can see that the resources to move closer to Krishna are so many, and they can come from so many channels to me. And if essentially, if it is helping me to chant better, if it is helping me to remember Krishna better, it's helping me to connect with Krishna better, then rejecting that would be like false renunciation. Mm -hmm. That's what yes. we are told we should not do falgu vairagya. Yeah, and we are told to accept those things which are favorable and reject those things that are unfavorable. You know, and 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 that may be different things at different points in our life. Even Srila Prabhupada, when the doctor told him and his his disciples at that time, the old man just needs to walk a little more when he had his heart attack. And and that's what the doctor told him. He needs to walk more. What did Prabhupada do? He started doing morning walks every morning to keep his health together so that he could support us and help us and, and teach us. So, um, and that was a materialistic doctor. But Krishna works in so many ways. Like you said, it's an expansion of our perspective. We want to expand our perspective of how Krishna can help us. You know, otherwise we miss out on how much Krishna really is helping us all the time. Oh, so the way you're putting that... it is that we might be in the name of saying that we are connected with Krishna, we might actually be disconnecting ourselves from Krishna because we are missing out on the many ways in which Krishna is helping us. Yeah, beautifully put. Could be. I mean, we can misuse anything, and we can, we can even misuse spiritual practices. And as we broaden our perspective, we can use anything in Krishna's service. So it's really about our use or our misuse. And... Um, I've misused the philosophy a lot, and I misunderstood, and I had misconceptions about it. Um, that's a misuse of the actual absolute truth. However, when we expand, we can actually use, Prabhupada used so many things in expanding the Krishna consciousness movement. He used rock music. He used you know, famous people. He used insignificant people. He used so many different things. Mm. You know, one of the things which I found special about your book, which is something which I feel is a huge need in today's uh, world, is that uh, emotions unresolved emotions can be a huge challenge. And if you just give like a one-dimensional instruction, just control your mind, that doesn't work. And in your books, the way you have provided so many insights to help 
actually address emotions in such a way that a per, though they at least they don't become stumbling blocks on the path to krishna that is invaluable so maybe well, if you want to um, uh, go in that direction okay what i'd like to say is um you know krishna is the most intelligent <laughs> and he gave us a body for a reason he gave us a mind for a reason and he designed the body and the mind in such a way that um he really wants us to win in this human form of life so the body gives us so many signals and in fact the body takes care of so much stuff so that our consciousness doesn't have to be distracted imagine if we had to think now i have to breathe I got to take another breath. If we had to think of that, that's all we would be thinking of. I got to take another breath. But no, he created mm. our body in such a way that it can seamlessly breathe. It can seamlessly keep our heart beating, pumping the blood through our body, digesting our food. And we don't have to be really aware of it. It's an auto autonomic system. It does it automatically because he knew that if he didn't do that, we would just die. We wouldn't survive. However, we don't, you know, in our philosophy, um, you know, we're not the body. We're not the body, but we're given a body. And in fact, it says in scripture that the human form of life is, is a gift. It's a gift. It's the best, the best life there is. Now we have a human body, we have a human mind, we got exactly what we needed from where we left off in our last life. However, if we denigrate our body, denigrate our mind, and like almost neglect, ignore, and push away, like I shouldn't have a body, you know, I shouldn't be a body, I shouldn't take care of my body, we're actually pushing away the gift that Krishna gave us. We're not using it. He didn't say, neglect your body and push it away. Prabhupada didn't say that. He said, use it. We need to use it. And we also need to pay attention because it, it's, it's giving us information. It gives us information. When our stomach hurts, it's giving us information. Oh, maybe I ate something that I'm not able to digest. You know, maybe I ate too much. It's giving us a signal. It's giving us information. But then if we just take something to cover that over and continue with the habit of eating things that we can't digest or eating too much, we're going to just increase the effects of our misuse of our body and our digestive system. That's one simple example. Now we'll take the emotions. Emotions mm. are part of the bhakti culture. Bhakti is about emotions. Nectar of devotion is about emotions. Sorry, can I just what? interrupt you a little bit? Please, go ahead. If you don't Please mind. interrupt. Just, since you talk about the body, okay, I'd like go ahead. To, we have discussed this point also earlier, that you know, there's a difference between, say, being in bodily consciousness and being conscious of the body. Yes. So yes. I think yes. the the first is is criticized so much and justifiably so that we don't want to be pandering to the body's urges for pleasure, for sense gratification. But in that process, we might neglect the fact that the body is a vital functional tool. And when it is functioning properly or when it's not functioning properly. It gives us those signals. And if we neglect the, those signals in the name of being spiritual, then uh, that can be a problem. And Prabhupada also did say that. Prabhupada, for example, is, is said to have said that you know, if you sleep too little, you will become crazy. You know, if you sleep too much, you will become lazy. So the Bhagavad also says regulation. 
that regulation in sleeping and eating so now how would we know what is regulation it is in many ways by listening to the body and listening to yes. the signals that the body is giving yeah so yes. in that yes. sense being conscious of our body is a, a part of being krishna conscious is not opposed to being krishna conscious no and i yeah i like the way you said it instead of being body conscious we're not like focusing on the body 24/7 but when it gives us a signal, we pay attention. It's trying to tell us something. Yeah. Like when we have to go to the bathroom, generally, usually, that's something that we can, we can only suppress so long. And, and even eating, we can only suppress that so long we need to do that. Well, there are other things that we need to pay attention to. And if we don't, we'll die. So, um, yes. but we think this, we just really, you know, and we can neglect a lot of things, which, you know, are not maybe life and death. You know, we can neglect things that are maybe not life and death. However, in that neglect, are we, are we causing ourselves, are we creating more pain for ourselves and more distress for the body, which will interfere with our ability to serve, if not today, in a year, two, three, 20 years, are we are we really being grateful and 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 utilizing the body and the mind, or are we being neglectful and abusing the body and the mind in the name of service? So use nicely put. There's a use, quote of Prabhupada in one use, letter where he says that if you don't take care of your health now, in future, mm -hmm. even if you are very enthusiastic, you will not be able to serve Krishna. So yeah, yeah. So in that sense, yeah. that's important. The body yeah. is a foundation. It's it's our vehicle to move around. I mean, sometimes I think we treat our cars better than we treat our, our bodies, you know? And also one point I bring up, you know, in it, it's that I think that we know more about these things, our cell phones and our computers. We know much more about them and how they operate than we understand about our own body which is like something that we're utilizing 24 seven for our whole life. We don't want to trade in this model too soon. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. So I think that's a valid point. So then we could move forward to what I think is the core part of our podcast. That is that while we want to be conscious of our body, we also need to be conscious of our mind and one of the key features of it is our emotions. So you're mentioning right. about how emotions are an integral part of bhakti, but sometimes there is a radical differentiation between material emotions and spiritual emotions. And we are told right. that all material emotions should be neglected, rejected. But I feel that that kind of black and white doesn't work because emotion all my emotions are ultimately a part of the mind and those emotions are telling us something which we have to at least need to acknowledge even if we don't want to act on it immediately isn't it right right well generally um emotions are really information again just like the body when it has a pain in it it has a pain so that we'll pay attention the nervous system has sensories that say hey something's not functioning the way it's supposed to be functioning it it gives us a little bit of pain so that we'll pay attention otherwise if it didn't give us pain we definitely wouldn't be paying attention to it emotions are the same thing um even even anger um these emotions are giving us information they're giving us information um sometimes it can be information like i am tired and i can't handle too much more anymore and so i'm getting kind of snappy 
at the people and the devotees around me because actually I'm tired or I'm too stressed. I have too much work on my head, too many things to deal with. I feel overwhelmed. And then I can't handle it. I can't hold anymore. And so I start throwing it on others. Also, a lot of our emotions that come up have to do with past um, traumas and even past life, things that we didn't process. And these emotions, they affect our consciousness. So if we don't pay attention to them, we're not paying attention to something that has a huge effect on our consciousness. So rather than being judgmental, I'm a devotee, I shouldn't be angry. Why are you being angry? You're a bad person. You're a bad devotee. Rather than being judgmental, we could be curious. Wow, wh why am I so angry? Why am I so upset? Why am I so depressed? What's going on? And then investigate and pray and see, wow, maybe there's something here that's subtle that I'm not seeing, which is affecting me. Now, we have a material body and a material mind. And that came into effect because of our subtle body. All our past consciousness, our past emotions, our past experiences, our travel in our subtle body. And from the subtle, then the gross is manifest. So this, this gross part is just a manifestation of our subtle. So if we really want to affect our consciousness and become Krishna conscious, we want to become Krishna conscious, not body conscious. We may mm. have to address the subtle aspects of our subtle body and our mind, which are affecting us all the time, but which we can't see. They're kind of like apps on the phone that are running in the background. So we don't really know that they're running. I mean, unless you know you're computer really good and then you can look oh yeah that's running that's draining my battery they have applications that tell you which applications are draining your battery we don't have that for the material body we have to be self-aware these these subtle aspects are draining our energy and affecting our consciousness which affects our ability to practice and dive deeply and connect, you know, with Krishna. So the emotions are so valuable. They're, they're pains asking us to pay attention. There's something here for you to look at, something here for you to learn. There's something that's not complete in this area. If we were totally equal-minded, if we saw everyone as no one as friend, no one as enemy, if we were totally on that platform, then we could maybe just practice Krishna consciousness straight, straight on. But we've got a lot of stuff that we've brought with us. And, and if we don't complete that, we will repeat that. There's a wise saying, whatever we don't complete, we're destined to repeat. That's karma. That's samsara. So we have our conditioning. We have our conditioned habits. Our false ego is a, um, is a manifestation of our conditioning and our conditioned thought patterns of the way we perceive and see the world the decisions and beliefs we brought with us and reinforced and gathered evidence to prove. So these subtle beliefs um, affect our consciousness. If we had 
full faith in Krishna, full trust in Krishna, and only thought of Krishna, well, we, first of all, we probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> I, can I just interrupt here? It's Please almost interrupt. like if I play the devil's advocate over here, you are saying that bhakti will work only when you have pure bhakti. Otherwise, uh, bhakti will not work. No, you know, no, that, no, I'm not saying that. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if it came across like that. We practice I'll bhakti. That's, that's, I understand you're not saying that. But thank you. But, but what that's you're great that you is brought that, that in. Yeah, it's like as long as you have impurities, you cannot practice bhakti properly. And if you cannot practice bhakti properly, bhakti is not going to work in your life. But in the whole point no, of I'm bhakti not... is to help us deal with our impurities, isn't it? Yes, yes. And bhakti will bring those things up. Bhakti will bring those things up. The chanting does bring these things up to our consciousness. But then we say, oh, I'm fallen. I'm a bad devotee. No, you are being purified. Look at it. See what it is that's there. That's the impediment and see what it is and see what to do about that. We don't have to make a judgment about it. We just need to pay attention to it. So what I'm saying is not that, you know, we only need pure bhakti. I'm saying if we have, if we're at that place, then, <laughs> then we don't need to look at all these things. But we're not at that place. I mean, there are people, there are devotees who are pure. The majority of us have something to work on. So we're here for a reason. We're here to work on that. And it's not a mechanical process. It's a personalized and real, individual, self-reflective, self-aware process. I can't tell you necessarily what you need to work on. I'm not in your body. I don't know what goes on exactly inside of your consciousness. I don't know exactly what you believe or what you're telling yourself. That's something for you to do. I can't chant your rounds for you. That's something for you to do. So there is some responsibility that we have to pay attention to the signals that are coming to us as part of of our purification it's part it's of our purification so what you are saying essentially is that being if we consider being krishna conscious it also means that krishna has made us as individuals and while there are universal principles we all have a personal relationship with krishna and how our personal journey toward Krishna is going, you know, it is for us to navigate that journey. You know, it's uh, that our, you know, our guru cannot walk our spiritual journey for us. It is we who have to walk. And in that sense, the messages that we are getting from our body and our mind, they are some things which we have to deal with. Prabhupada also said that it's like a fighter pilot. You can get training from your guides on the ground, but once you are in the plane, you have to fight your own, you have to fly your own plane. And that means understanding what signals are coming from my plane. Okay, maybe I need to move left, maybe I need to move right, maybe I need to duck downwards, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, it's a, I think that's, that's a very good point. Yeah, that you're saying, what you're saying is that we are not talking about. Uh, Krishna conscious being deficient in any way, what we are saying is that we may have a deficient understanding of Krishna consciousness, that Krishna consciousness has that personal aspect and we are just becoming more aware of the individual personal dynamics of Krishna consciousness. And that means actually we are becoming more Krishna conscious. Yes. Yes. And I love the example of yes. flying our own plane. We do get guidance. The scriptures guide us, our gurus guide us, and we do need support. We need sadhu sangha. We need encouragement when things are tough. You know, we need, a, you know, cheerleaders and people to, they can share with us what helped them. Now, what helped them 
may or may not help us, just like someone who has chronic fatigue. There's so many reasons to have chronic fatigue. Somebody say, oh, do this. This worked for me perfect. It may not work for the under, other individual. Someone may have fatigue because they're not following the circadian rhythm and, they're, and they're, their body's fatigued because they're not following the natural rhythm. Someone may have fatigue because um, their body may have autoimmune and may be attacking themselves. Someone may have fatigue because they're getting COVID. So not every it's not the same solution for each even form of, of fatigue. Each form of fatigue may require something else. Someone may need rest and then they may not be able to get rest. So really we have to pay attention. We're the one in this body. And that's our, our right, our birthright, and it's our responsibility also. Nicely put. Thank you. So it's a, uh, so we could say that in one sense, in bhakti, we, we get a clear understanding of what the purpose is, that we want to develop our relationship with Krishna, we want to love Krishna, but then the resources of what will be favorable and what will not be favorable for us, that is something which we as an individual have to decide. So, so can you tell me what resources you found uh, helpful in, say, addressing the physical and the emotional side of bhakti? Well, mm. one thing I wanted to just add on to that, and then I'll answer your question, is like, like we need to determine what works for us. So as a very, very young devotee, um, I had to move and chant. I had to walk and chant. I had to do that. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to, you know, even chant or even stay awake. Now, as a much older devotee, I find that I can get much more focus by sitting and I practice sitting and chanting. So at different phases of our Krishna consciousness, different things may work. And then that may change and adjust as we go in our Krishna consciousness. Now, now that I said that, I forgot your question. So could you ask me again? Okay, sure. Yeah, thank you. So, so nice point. But what I was saying is, you, would you like to talk about some specific resources or tools oh, that oh, you yes, yes. found helpful in navigating well, the emptiness or the overwhelming of emotions that you encountered in midlife? Well, um, I just prayed to Krishna because I didn't know what to do. And then a, a devotee friend of mine mentioned something to me, maybe you want to take this course. And so I just started taking courses outside. Um, um, I did different courses uh I did landmark education. I did compassionate communication. And um, these were not, uh, none of, there were no courses such as these within ISKCON at that time. And I just took the courses and my whole intention for taking the courses was to be able to do my services and to be Krishna conscious. That was my intention. My intention in taking the courses was not, to avoid those but it was like how can i how can i keep doing my services with what i'm dealing with and um i was at a point where i i i really at that point i had wanted to kill myself it was pretty bad because i was just so frustrated i've been doing this for 27 years and now i'm like i feel like i'm like worse than i was before i started you know like what what is going on here, Krishna? You know, what what is going on here? So I think um, for all of us, sometimes we, we hit a wall and it, 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 it might be a wall that we've never passed through before. Like we can sometimes um, go on in Krishna consciousness for a certain period of time. But then if we really need to advance, we've got to break through something that we never broke through before. We've got to 
go through something. So, and and that's difficult because we're so, even even the way we do Krishna consciousness sometimes is fueled by our conditioning and our strength and our ego mechanisms. So um, in taking these courses, especially because um, there was no Krishna conscious lingo, I was able, but because I was looking at it from the perspective of, of how will this help me with my Krishna consciousness, Krishna was able to show me things that I could no longer see within the Krishna conscious realm because it had become too um, familiar, like familiarity. You just can't see the benefit of it anymore. So what they were saying, a lot of the things that they were saying were truths, even from scripture, there was truth there. And then when I took those truths and applied them and read the Bhagavad Gita, because they were expressed in different words, I could then, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, this is what they're saying. They're really saying this is what it says in Bhagavad Gita, but I could see the connection. And then because really anything that has any truth to it, it came from Krishna. Um, and and so we can find these truths. And then because I was able to hear them now, I could hear them kind of newly. And because I could hear them mm. newly, then I could start integrating them in a new way in my life. And and but what happened was I was trying to really work on my emotion. Like, why am I so angry? Why am I so upset? What's going on here? And unbeknownst to me it was stuff that was buried from my childhood and and even my my mother said well maybe it has something to do with your brother you know and i'm like my brother you know like this is this is when i'm 48 so i hadn't really been with my brother for what 30 40 years or 35 years no, there's, I don't have a problem with my brother because I had pushed everything down, um, you know. And so, um, but then <laughs> little by little, when my anger came out at somebody else, they said, why are you angry at me? Why are you so angry at me? And because I was curious now, instead of in the defense mode, well, because you did this and that, because I wasn't, I was curious. I was like, I don't know. I didn't really come here to be angry, but clearly I am angry. I don't know why I'm angry. And then I just kept asking myself for days, why was I angry? Why was I angry? Why was I angry? And then when the apparent reason for my anger came into my purview, it was like an epiphany. I could share that. But even that epiphany was not the answer why I was angry in that moment, in that present day, had a connection with my mother and my brother. Because my brother and I fought for decades, and he would hurt me, and I hurt him back with words. He hurt me physically. And I wanted my mother to stop it, you know. But how much can a mother do? So I was really angry at my mother for not stopping that, but I had never spoken about that. I had never verbalized that. I had never, you know, looked at that. I had never confronted that. I just buried it. And then it came out in my other relationships. When people were fighting, I would be angry. Why are you fighting? Why are you yelling? And I was yelling while I was telling them not to yell because not only was I resisting, you know, what I had experienced, I actually became just like that. I became a yeller. And then I was angry at myself for being what I hated. All of that. I don't know. Does that help any? Does that make any sense? So if I understand right, what you're saying is, 
through various uh, tools and exercises and courses yes you were able to uh, make sense of your present emotions by exploring your past and by well, i started linking yeah. linking the uh, linking the past with the present now this is well, this brings us to a very uh, let me just complete this that sometimes in krishna consciousness we seem to say that okay my past was just the past filled with maya and i left it behind and i have come to krishna but it's more like we don't just leave it behind we carry it with us we build on it so that past is still there with us yeah and it does surface so it sometimes lot, a lot of the work i do is about completing the past actually completing it tying it up sending it down the ganges like like it's actually complete and um so what you meant earlier when you said completing or repeating so yes yes there don't are, there complete, are some things yes. there are something unprocessed something yes. loose something unprocessed and we need to yes deal with it and that's where it gets completed yes yes ignoring it pretending it's not there denying it suppressing it doesn't make it go away it would be nice if it made it go away but that's not the process of purification the process of purification the chanting brings these things up and then what we do we peel the layers layer by layer it says in bhagavad gita we're covered we're covered we can't paste krishna consciousness on top of these coverings it won't stick it won't stick so we have to peel the layers we have to peel the layers yeah. and then we come to the point of our our soul self we come to that place that's where the krishna consciousness is it's not something we artificially impose upon the mind prapad said that krishna consciousness is not an artificial imposition on the mind but so that's so prabhupad said that but start. sometimes you know the prabhupad did say that but we could say that sometimes our practice of krishna consciousness might be an artificial imposition mm. it was so for me it is <laughs> yeah that's a good way of looking at yeah. it that uh, yeah when something so is in... yeah when something is ahead, just like a ritual that i am practicing and i am going through the motions but if it is not actually connecting with my soul if it's not awakening my soul if say sometimes if we are trying to chant and our mind is very disturbed and then we may try to chant more vigorously but the mind is so disturbed that it just doesn't help maybe at that time we need to do something else like maybe take a few deep breaths maybe read something else maybe just hear some kirtans so it's that it's not that we are saying the chanting doesn't work all that we are saying is at that particular time chanting is not connecting with us with krishna connecting our soul with krishna so then it that is the time when it could be like i'm imposing it externally and it's not happening so i need to remove those coverings yeah. at least yeah. not remove the covering at least create some hole in the coverings create yeah. some passage way through which that yeah uh, that chanting can go in and it does happen that sometimes you take a little deep deep breaths or just just sitting and chanting like you earlier said walk and chant and that does help so that's a very nice way of putting it that uh, yeah. we are if we in one sense try to try to in one sense try to use brute force to try to push krishna into our consciousness it may not work it probably won't <laughs> because we can't force our way into krishna and and krishna is not going to force his way into us he wants us to be an open vessel to receive him but we can't really receive him when we're filled with all this other stuff that we haven't dealt with it's it's taking up bandwidth it's taking up space in our consciousness and 
like you said, that when you're chanting, if something comes up, you might just stop and write all that stuff and just write it all down and get it out of your mind and just write it all down. Then you can say, okay, it's on a piece of paper. We can think about this later. Then you can chant. And then later on, you can take that paper and then look, you know, what was, what was I doing there? What was so important to me? What was I, what was I all, what was going on there? Being curious and then work on it and deal with it. And when you're curious and when you ask, Krishna can answer. In the Bible, it says, ask and ye shall receive. Knock, and the door shall be opened. You have not, because you ask not. So sometimes we take on Krishna consciousness, and we get a lot of the theory, and we know a lot. But sometimes our knowing can get in the way of our growing. Because if I know, if I know, then I'm not going to be open to seeing anything broader. I'm not going to be in, uh, open to seeing anything else, even if it's coming from Krishna. So, you know, yeah. Hmm. It's very nice. So when you're saying knowing can come in the way of growing, I like the way you it's a very beautiful, poetic way of phrasing it. If I understand what I mean by that is, here you are using knowing to refer to our own preconceptions about what we are meant to do and how we are meant to be. And growing means being more open to the many ways in which Krishna may be revealing a path to us through our body, through our mind, through the situation that we are facing in our life. And to the extent yes. we recognize those, to that extent, we will be able to move forward. Yes. Krishna is alive and real. So we can read and we can get the theory. But Krishna is like walking with us every day and giving us chances to apply the theory. And as we apply, then we get realization in reality. Realization comes from reality. When we're doing something in reality, we get a realization. So mm. the theory is helpful. I, when I had all the theory and I went and did the courses outside, the theory helped me to see Krishna and Krishna's energy and even Krishna's truth coming in different forms. But I could see that it was the truth, Krishna's truth, and it correlated with stuff in our scriptures it was just coming in a different form in a form that i could then digest and utilize and it helped to nourish my spiritual life so yeah yeah beautifully put. and um so yeah like and maybe since we are a little bit running out of time it would be wonderful to talk yes, about yes. We could, uh, can you maybe share something about how the wisdom that you glean and it help you? How have you made that accessible to other devotees? So you went through your journey and you learned something, and it's not just something which you want, you it has benefited you. You have made it in one sense your mission to share this wisdom with others. So I, I presume your books are a part of it. But if somebody wants to help in, somebody wants to process their emotions and go in this journey, how can they access uh, the insights that you have? Well, when you say I went through my journey, I have to correct you. I'm still going through my journey. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. <laughs> so I'm still <laughs> on my journey. The journey is every day. There's a new a new part of my journey and today this is part of my journey so um what's come to me more recently and i just want to put this in is karuna care which is a um an uh, affiliate part of iskan started by ram baru um vaishnavi 
And um, I'm taking her courses and doing facilitation in some of those courses also. And it's really about emotions as information. Some courses are just starting this, uh, this week. Grief, the impact of grief on our spirituality, um, trauma and complicated grief. And she, she's, so she's put a lot of the things um, into courses and she's made it into a format. So that's one thing I'm still doing. That's part of my current journey. And, um, you know, I just came by pieces and pieces and pieces. Um, compassionate communication was part. And I, I was asked to help to write a book. And then um, it ended up that it turned out that... Um, I ended up writing my own book and the other person wrote their own book. And that's how this first book came out, Revealing the Heart, the Practice of Compassion. This came out in 2012. So this is the first part of one of my journeys. And Krishna tricked me into doing it because I was helping someone. And I put two years into the book that didn't work at all. <laughs> but I didn't want to throw those two years out. So I just took those and then designed them into a book so it would be complete so I wouldn't feel angry or resentful that I had invested two years something came out of it, it was complete and then I was mm. like being available for devotees and talking and listening to devotees and um there was certain themes that I continued to repeat certain things about the false ego and understanding our false ego and what it is and and why we have one and um how we can use it rather than being used by it. And I ended up kind of repeating the same things over and over again. So I thought that, you know, maybe if I could just download some of this stuff um, and put it in books that, you know, people could read that and then I wouldn't have to reiterate everything over and over. They could get some basic foundation. And then if they wanted to talk to me, we could go a little deeper. That was my that was my idea. And I thought I had done enough seminars and courses I could just kind of take and put it together and make it into a book. Well, mm. Krishna tricked me again. And it wasn't really that simple. Um, but luckily, COVID happened. So I had two years to work on the book. So the book came out and it came out as two volumes because I was told by a number of devotees, it's too long. So you got to make it into two volumes. So the first volume is called Finding the Gap, Some Truth About mm -hmm. the Lies We Tell Ourselves. So this is about mostly the mind and the false ego. And um, as a matter of and as a matter of fact, as you can see, these are the two birds in the heart. And it's kind of mm. cold. It's all blue and kind of frozen. And there's nothing growing on the tree. And the bird is kind of on autopilot. He's kind of zoned out. And Krishna's trying to talk. And the bird isn't really registering much. So this is kind of how we are when our false ego is running us, which it does. And it does need to be there. It's one of the automatic systems that we do need. Otherwise, we'd have to learn how to talk every day. <laughs> we'd have to relearn how to walk every day. So we do have programs that help us to have some consistency. So that's what this book is about. And then the second part focuses on the Anartas, which I renamed as Habits. And here we start to integrate. Instead of resisting our habits and shaming ourselves for being so conditioned, excuse me, that's why we're here, we start to pay attention. This is called entering the gap. And we start paying attention and we start integrating the lessons of all of the things that we experience and feel. And then we turn more to Krishna. We talk to Krishna. We listen to Krishna. What's going on here? We're curious. We ask questions. And then we start to grow. Um. So those, those are those two books. Um, and it's written as a story. It's also an allegory. And it's a conversation between three devotees, Jiva, Jago, 
and Karuna. And it's about Jeev Jago waking up and we need Karuna compassion to wake up. And so um, it's, it's a very, um, I just, I put all my mistakes in the books so that the devotees don't have to make the same mistakes. They can make their own mistakes. And my misconceptions and what I came to understand through my many mistakes and, um, yeah, we're, I just want to say that being so, a soul in a human machine is one of the most challenging lives that there is because we do have consciousness. Animals, they don't know how to hold grudges and be upset. They're just scared and they're just, you know, they're on a lower level. But because we have consciousness, it's a great, it's a great gift, but it also requires the responsibility to use that gift in a way that's um, healing and growing. And, um, and I just feel that we need all the help we can get. And we come to Krishna consciousness. So then we're going against the grain of society and we're in a human machine. We need all the support we can get. So I put in these books, you know, the many different things that I studied, the Enneagram, um, uh, so many different systems that I've learned about family constellations, all of these things i think that krishna is so kind that he said it because he figures okay at least maybe you'll get one of them or maybe you'll get something to help you somehow to heal those wounded parts of us the wounded child inside of us the the wounded soul inside of us that's separated from krishna and uh and so i just put them all on these books because devotees don't tend to read such uh Philosoph uh, psychological points in other books. So I put them and I integrated them with our spiritual practice so that you don't have to read outside books. You can read these and then get a sense. And then, then you can investigate and see maybe some of these outside books could help me. And they won't hurt my Krishna consciousness. They might help my Krishna consciousness. So there's, there's that. And Thank then... You. Do you want so these books are available Amazon? on Amazon? These books no, are they're not okay. available on Amazon. They're available from me right now. I haven't put them on Amazon yet, and I haven't made a Kindle okay. version yet because they just got printed. But if anybody wants a copy, they can write to me. Um, at okay, so we'll put our email ID over there. A heart, I think a heart connect. Yeah. Okay. I think they're also available in India through the Golden Media, isn't it? Uh, golden Age Media. Mm -hmm. In yeah. India, Golden yeah. Age Media. Yeah. And then um, okay. if you write to me at aheartconnection at gmail.com, then I can send them out to you. Okay, perfect. And do you also plan to do some... Uh, you're also available as a online counselor for those who would like to have some personalized guidance? Well, I I, I don't want to open myself up too wide because I, I, I feel that quality is important. Um, what I would say is if someone wants to take the time, if they really want help, if they take the time to read these books um, and or take um, some of the Karuna Care classes, um, they'll have some foundation from which we can um, build or or look at um, you know what they what they would like to address personally um, because we all have personal things that we want to look at. So I I could be available. Um, I I'm not going to say that I am available all the time, but I could be available if depending on what the situation is and if a person you know would also be invested in in reading and looking looking at another perspective rather than me having to 
tell them everything on the first couple of coaches yeah, that they exactly. can Makes read sense. the books, then then they would be prepared. And then when I say something, they could I could fine tune the points. That would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. So uh, you already provided uh, your in, your broad insights in the books, and then once they uh, they have those, then a specific guidance would be more effective. Effective in terms of yeah. both utilization of your time and effective in terms of they also being able to go deeper. So. Yeah, and utilization of their time also, that they can read at their own pace and integrate, and then then we could maybe do something. Um, yeah. But I, yes. I, I, I can't open myself up too wide because it, 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 everybody has, has something they need to work on. And, and, and that's why I like the Karuna Care programs because we're training people. We're training people how to listen to themselves and how to be self-aware. We're training. And um, there's a progressive way of being trained. And then some of these trainees will, will also be listeners and counselors. So mm. yeah, we need more counselors within our movement. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we should, we could do a, in future a podcast about Corona care. So would you like to do that? Or would it be best to do it with Ramburu? Devi, um, Maybe you could have the two of us on. Sorry? Maybe you could have the two of us on. She's, yeah, she's, the, she's the face of Karuna Care. You know, she is she's the initiator. She 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 started it, you know. So she is the founder acharya of Karuna Care. So you need to have her on. I don't know if you'd need to have me on, but I would be willing to be on. Um, yeah, okay. there are courses that are that are available, and one of the courses is starting in 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 less than a week. Um, and if you go if you go to the website and check it out, Karuna Care, Karuna Care .iscon .org, those courses are listed on there, and how to register for them. The first one is the impact of grief. And I'm facilitating one of those classes. And we have it at two different times so that people in India can take it. People in um, um, Australia can take it. UK can take it. And the USA, it's it's available for all different time zones. So we could do that at another point in time. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah. I'll just quickly summarize. I think broadly okay. we discussed from your personal journey how you felt that to move on, to keep moving on in your Krishna consciousness, especially in the middle part of your life, the you felt the need for some additional supports, additional sub insight, support, strategies. And then if we have an inclusive vision of Krishna consciousness, we see Krishna can be guiding us from so many different sources. And Prabhupada had that openness where Prabhupada could even take insights from a postman and it's not it's that we because we are individuals so we have our individual relationship with Krishna and our individual journey toward Krishna and it is Krishna who has given us our body and mind and that is not just given to be rejected and renounced the body and mind can also be messengers for us to learn how best these tools can be used. So we don't want to be bodily conscious, but we want to be conscious of the body. And similarly, we can see emotions as information. And then once we have this more inclusive understanding of Krishna consciousness, then we can explore various tools which can help us understand the source of our emotions. Say, for example, if I'm feeling unreasonably angry at a particular point. Why is that? So we could go backwards into our past and do some excavation to understand it. And then the point is that when we attain a certain level of closure or complete, when we are completing something, then we won't be repeating it. Otherwise, those unprocessed things from our past will keep us, will keep pushing us towards repeating unhealthy or self-destructive behavioral patterns and to that extent 
the the various insights which uh, come from psychology or from various sources we can say that they are also speaking truths that are given in our bhakti tradition in the bhagavad gita but it's with a different lingo lingo a different frame of reference and it, instead of for every devotee to actually go through all that complicated journey if the integration done by krishna's guidance can be presented it becomes so much easier so that's what you are try to done do in your books and krishna consciousness is not meant to be like a imposition from outside where we try to use brute force to try to bring krishna into us or to push ourselves towards krishna if there are some coverings that are blocking that link with krishna then whatever resources we can use to remove those coverings we see that also as a part of our krishna consciousness and then we can develop more and more in our personal relationship with krishna and the books are resources and the courses are also resources which are available for those who would like to explore this journey more any points you would like to add i thought that was a great summarization yeah yeah and and really um you know we all go through difficult times in krishna consciousness we all do it's 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 part of the purificatory process and um you know we may grit our teeth and go through it but is our consciousness evolving is or is our consciousness being kind of just constrained you know and you can see that anybody who goes through any difficulty and their consciousness is expanding they feel that that situation brought them closer to krishna that it actually expanded their perspective and their understanding of krishna so um that's what we want to do we want to we want to really expand our perspective and really see that krishna is helping us in so many ways in so many places and um you know he's not just coming through one little straw he's 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 here helping us regularly so how can we perceive him we need to really kind of open up our vision a little bit our perspective yes yeah. thank you as beautifully put thank you thank you very much for sparing your time thank for you joining for this me. podcast Hare thank you krishna. for inviting me letting me share hari krishna hari krishna thank you